we've had a lot of people come in. I, first of all, I want to tell you, and, I, and I'm going to tell you a little story. And, I, and some of you guys have heard this story before, but if you haven't, if you have, I'm sorry, but I'm going to tell it again. In 2013, uh, Kevin Weaver and I had the opportunity to you know, sit down with Coach Clearman and Coach Etheridge, one of our special guests today. Uh, we were invited over to Coach Clearman's house. We spent a great hour and a half, two hours there. What happened, Kevin and I walked away from that event, or that, that time we spent together, and we thought, wow, there's a lot of people that need to do what we did. So in 2013, we gathered a bunch of eagles, and uh, we had a wonderful event. Actually, it was publicized in the paper uh, locally, about a three-page article. Some of the guys missed it. Through that, we decided that we would do something like this. One of the things uh, that I'm so happy about is that we have the ladies here tonight. Uh, you know, yeah, very much so. And let me tell you what. It's, it's like my wife, I ask her occasionally, I said, how did you put up with me all these years? And, and you know, I look at... I know, I, I know this is a special group of guys, but we are kind of rambunctious. But we're going to start our evening now, now that I've found my glasses. And uh, I want to thank you that you're all here. So we're going to speak. So I, I'm, getting, I'm getting hungry, okay? So, uh, by the way, there's another group of guy people here that are people that were just friends. People that uh, uh, we have a great deal of desire for. People, you know, like, gosh, I've had Tony Hastings came all the way in from Iowa. You know, he was just a buddy. I'm glad to have him here. You know, he was, he was a contact, you know. We've got uh, we've got some special people really that have, have really helped put this thing together, and I want them to st stand up as uh, we begin to start this evening. Okay, I'd like everybody to stand up, and uh, and we've got a flag up over here, and uh, I'd like us to start with the pledge of allegiance. Okay, I'll start it. And here we go. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic. Cooper. Of course, Mr. Kevin Weaver. And Mr. Vernon Patterson. And Mr. Ronnie Pryor. Uh, Mr. Pete Farmer, he's not here tonight. He just got out of the hospital yesterday, so y'all say a little prayer for him, okay? Uh, Mr. Pat McMurray. And the guy that I just think the world of is Mr. Johnny Johnson. Thank you, guys. <laughs> you know, I remember in 1968 when he, when he showed up in Hobbs, New Mexico, him and his group of coaches. They took a ragtag bunch of dudes that just really, we were all kind of in the weeds, okay? You know, but they came to us in junior high, I remember this, and they said, you know, every one of you guys can be winners. And, you know, they taught us how to be winners, but more importantly, they taught us how to be men. They taught us how to work. And, you know, and I look around this room, and the success in this room is amazing. And, uh, you know, I, I know what you guys do for a living, most of you, and I'm so proud of you. But it all started, certainly with their mamas and their daddies, but these guys were turned over. They, we got turned over to these guys, and you know what? They made us a little bit better. Mr. Doug Etheridge. Staff here very long. He told me one minute at the most. <laughs> the first thing I'd say is you need to thank Bobby Kelly 
and the people who got this together because these are memories and things that will last you a lifetime. And in my case, you know, that's not very long. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's amazing the number of guys that y'all get together and come here and it's a, it's a wonderful thing. It, uh, you, you just need to think, Bobby, and, and appreciate it. When I, I go to high school, when I, when I was in high school, we have a high school reunion. We have one uh, lady that does all the calling for, for our high school group. And right now, she's, there's only about 19 of us left, so she doesn't have near the problem. <laughs> There's a lot of teams and a lot of people to get a hold of. These memories that you have are something that are just wonderful. That you have such such things and, and time to spend, and uh, you have a, a, a guy that would go and help you, and, and you just don't know how much we enjoyed coaching guys at Hobbs. You had, you had a, a great attitude, you worked hard, you spent time doing it, you studied your parents, and it, it's, it's amazing the impression that you leave on me and other coaches, and, had, and it really helped me and our coaches, Coach Ken Clareman, you know, Ken was, was you, a lot of you know Ken as a basketball coach and uh, know him as he came as a sophomore football coach. Ken went with me in the South, South Texas. And Ken became the defensive coordinator and he did a super job, you know, uh, I'd hate to mention this, but you know, in the state of Texas, they have you can have at that time five playoff games, and Ken was a defensive coordinator on some teams that that uh, out of 20 games, we had an opportunity to play 18 of them and 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 won 15 of them and. Ken did a great job for us down there. I just, I, 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 that has nothing to do with y'all, if you understand that. Because, but y'all gave us the inspiration, the way you played, the dedication that you had, and helped us knowing what to expect of the next group of guys that we had playing. For that I would thank you because you had the kind of attitude that it takes to win championships and that's what you did. And, uh, once again, I, you can't compare teams, but you guys were as good as any group that we ever coached. You played as hard, had as good an attitude, did the kind of things that it takes to be champions. That's why I'm really proud to be part of this group. Pretty special memories, I'll tell you what, you think back to those times. Uh, we were supposed to have the current Hobbs High School coach, Coach uh, Charles Blickhorn. He sent me a picture of a plumbing problem he got into this morning, <laughs> and uh, his whole house was flooded, okay? And so he could not make it. So I've asked uh, a gentleman that's been involved in the Hobbs school systems, and we all know pretty well, we don't know how he ended up in the Hobbs school systems, but he did, and he done, he's done an amazing job. I've asked Pat to come in here and tell a little bit about what's going on at uh, the Hobbs High School today. Okay, thank you. It's great to be here. It's, uh, again, Bob, you did a great job. You and Kevin putting this together. And again, we're here to appreciate these coaches that we played and the guys that we played with. Uh, I have been with the Hobbs schools until I retired. I was with them for 36 years. I was a principal at the ninth grade school for the last 10 years. So uh, during that period of time, I did, I was on the committee to hire uh, a new football coach. 
and we interviewed probably three or four, and Coach Gleghorn uh, made a great impression on us, what, he, what his plan was, what he wanted to do, and it, a lot of it has to do with what Coach Ethers did, involve your, your junior highs, have your junior highs run the program that you, you run and oversee it, he coaches his coaches, uh, and this will be his uh, fourth year coming up, uh, he runs a spread offense, a no huddle offense, and it's just, you all seen the spread offenses, how fast they go. Uh, made the playoffs last year, this year he had a few bumps and uh, uh, miscues a few times, it cost him a few games or they'd have been in there. And uh, talking to him uh, this year, he's got, I know he's got four quarterbacks that he's looking at. Uh, one, he had a junior start this last year, but he's also got a sophomore that's really playing well, and he's got a ninth grader, at, and I think you you guys remember uh, Bruce Hardison, yeah, his his grandson is a ninth grader, and he's he's, he's a good quarterback, so he's got really, things are really looking up with what he's doing. Um, also, I'm on another committee, they put you on committees when you retire, <laughs> I'm going to pass out uh, and let you just look at them, uh, don't put this on Facebook because I don't the Hobbs public People in Hobbs haven't even seen it. So it's a facility improvement plan, things that they're going to do to the gym. Just real quickly, as you look at it, they are looking at building the new Tasker Arena. Now, again, a lot of people, well, that's like getting rid of the pit in Albuquerque or something. And uh, if you, you remember where the tennis courts were? That's where the new uh, Tasker Arena will, will be. The, and when you look at these pictures, at the football stadium, they're going to move the uh, home side to the to the east to the west side, so everybody wants to sit in the sun. So uh, it's a whole it's a real new concept. Uh, the practice fields they've all they're behind us now. They're on they're on they're on the uh, east side of the stadium. Uh, the new soccer field will be over there. They'll move the tennis courts out to the, the Taylor Ranch area. Uh, the schools about that material, and it could be a bond issue around 15 million or some surplus money that they have, they're not sure. Of course, the oil kind of went down when they first started doing this, but I, it's still, since I've been there, I think we failed one bond issue in 36 years I was there. So I, the Hobbs people have been real supportive of the Hobbs schools. So I'll pass these around and let you look at them and uh, turn this back over to Bobby, thank you. Guys, I take a lot of you guys don't get back to Hobbs in Mexico very much, but when you drive around Hobbs today, there's new schools going up literally everywhere. Uh, back where the Tookies was, they've got a brand new elementary going up there. So a lot going on in Hobbs, New Mexico. We're gonna actually gonna start dinner now. One of the things that we're gonna do is we're gonna have an audio of Harry McAdams. The game that I picked tonight is halftime. I'm going to kind of set it up for you. It was the 21 to 21 game that we won on penetrations in 1971. Okay, that game uh, going into the second half, the Hobbs Eagles were down 14 to nothing, and uh, somehow, with a lot of hard work and some really dedicated coaches, we came back and we beat that. We 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 won that game that night on penetrations. I love that game because I happen to have some old boys that I'm friends with over in Carlsbad, old Bobby Forrest and the Forrest family. And every time I see Bobby, he always gives me a hard time about what's gone on in Hobbs over the last 30, 40 years in their football program. But you know, I always got something I can fall back on. I can fall back and say, Bobby, what year was that? Uh, there's been, I think a couple of years that you guys won one, uh, lost one game in two years and you never made the playoffs. Okay, so you know he kind of frowns at me and throws at me. And you know every time I go in there, I've noticed my steak gets a little thinner. So, so you know a lot going on there. But we're gonna we've got a great buffet set up for everybody here. Uh, I want you guys to let's we're gonna go ahead and start that audio, and then we're really gonna get into kind of a neat part of our present our, our evening. We've got some guys up here that uh, I've asked to join me and talk a little about a bit about particularly years that they were involved in, okay? I was talking to Coach Evers a few minutes ago and he said, you know, just, just, he wanted to know that he looked out here with all the ladies and he said, boy, you guys did good. So, <laughs> so I think we did really, really well. And, you know, I want to, I want to recognize our wives and uh, our friends, and they're all friends. Let's give them all a hand in our
started now, and actually we're going to, going to just start with actually Mike Cooper. He's going to talk a little bit about 1969. I think that was before I was born. But, <laughs> but Mike, come on up, okay? Bob said we had six minutes to do 69. And then I got to thinking Coach Etheridge came in 68, so I thought six more minutes. And then I thought that, you know, we played, a lot of us played together as sophomores. I thought, well, six more minutes. <laughs> then I thought we played together in junior high. Six more minutes. Some of us played in seventh grade, and we played boys club together. Twelve more minutes. <laughs> Some of us played on sandlot together. Six more minutes. So y'all settle in. This is going to take a little. <laughs> Did you guys notice where I stationed myself? Okay, right now. <laughs> hey, I'll, I'll be quick because I I, I have a thing. That I, I like to talk more about um, people than I do first downs because to tell you the truth I couldn't get a first down today if my life depended on it but people are important so um, in 68 when we were sophomores coach came to town brand new he didn't have time to go to the junior highs to tell people how to to run the plays and, and he came in with a, a brand new program and went nine and two that's, that in itself is pretty impressive. Coach Etheridge, Coach Ellis, Coach Tone, and all the other coaches. The sophomores, we went 18-0. and 0. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna read you just some of the guys that played at that time, because you'll remember those, because as a kid, you're thinking about those guys. You're sitting in the stands wanting to be that guy. So here's the most important list of names that I'll read about 1968. Nicks, Brown, Spiegel, Box, Bach, Denton, and Howie. And that's not you, Dick. <laughs> Who is that? My sister. <laughs> <laughs> that's the cheerleaders. <laughs> See, your priorities change when you get older. <laughs> and when you get older. So, anyway. Looking back at 68 real quick, there were people like Tommy Fields, Kenny Baird, ring a, ring a bell, Tim, uh, Gary Dilworth, Bob Skinner, Ed Jeffers, uh, Johnny Thomas, Dennis Journey, Mark Hewlett, uh, Clovis Ratliff, Charlie DeJarnett, Larry Chambers, Kenny Pettis, Doug Hinkle, Bob Hubbard, Brent Wilburn, Bill Heckert, David McCall, Larry Ratliff, Lupe Carrillo, Willie Sessions, David Parker, and Greg Edwards. Those are guys when we were sophomores or you were ninth or eighth graders that were out there playing the game. They went nine and two, and that's, that in itself is pretty impressive. By the way, I'm gonna break and pause a couple times. Roy's not here tonight, and uh, I wish that he was Roy Cooper so I could apologize. Because several times over the years, people know that I'm from Lee County, and my name's Cooper, and they just assume that I was one of the ranching people. And there's a girl named Jimmy Ellen over in Tuscaloosa that if he ever runs into her, I just need for him to know that I didn't intentionally want to get him in trouble. Anyway, anyway, going back to the playing playing as kids together. Um, when we were, how long? How long, Arnold? 11? We were 11. Dan and Arnold and I and Irwin and several other guys played together as 11-year-olds. So the legacy of playing together with Terry through junior high and with, with Pat in high school and with these guys in grade school and Irwin in grade school, it, the, the legacy of football is not important. The legacy of friendship is important. So, uh, anyway, sophomores went 18 and 0, which means that there will be a lot of talented guys coming up for 1969. And in 1969, the important names were Haugen and Ball, and Haugen and Ball and Bach and McKeever. I'm telling you. I know it also came when I say that. <laughs> so um, anyway, in, in in those years, Coach, I need to spill the beans on something, 
and that's that. Have you guys ever seen the Seinfeld episode where Jerry sits down in the crowd at the opera, or the ladies do the piano recital, and he sets the little Pez dispenser down there, and and it makes Elaine laugh because he's acting up with the Pez dispenser. There were two guys that played on either side of me, Coach. And if you see them, you need to punish them. <laughs> Michael Moore on one side and Ralph Mitchell on the other side. They were seniors and I was a junior. Warburg. And we'd have we'd have the team meeting and you'd get up and you'd say very intelligent and important things to get us ready for the game. And those guys sit on either side of me intentionally every time and they'd go quack, 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 quack. <laughs> They make funny noises, and um, I think they ought to be punished. <laughs> anyway, uh, in, in that year, we went eight and five. We went to a state championship game. Um, the, the, two, the two things that I remember about that, that season specifically is we played Clovis in a ball game that was critical. It was a game that meant a chance to go to a, a state championship and win the district. And they had a quarterback, his name was Lewis Thomas, that played for UCLA, and, and a boy could play. He was good. He was good. And, and they were driving the field, as you'll remember, Coach, at the end of the game. And Lewis came up and made a throw, and it looked like it was over. And Steve Gamble intercepts. And he's gone down the field, down the sideline, and everybody's looking back. And Lynn Weber, where are you? Lynn was on the field looking for somebody to block. And he said he heard a whistle and he turned around and the referee was doing like this. And what had happened was a fellow from the other team had run off the sideline and hit Steve right between the eyes and he never saw it coming. So it was a touchdown game over and we win the game. A couple of years later, I'm playing baseball at Eastern University, Eastern New Mexico. There's a bunch of athletes, guys from New York and New Jersey and Boston playing there, and I tell them the story about that game. And and one of the guys said, well, that's the dumbest thing that I've ever heard. Who was that guy that did that? And a guy in the circle said, it was me. <laughs> guy I played baseball with, um, good kid. And I, I said, why'd you do it? He said, he was going to score. <laughs> so, okay. He was going to score. You stopped him. Um, I guess the last, the last story that I would, I would tell about that, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you the, analogy, or the anatomy of a play, is that um, Monty Box, one of the guys that played on that team as a junior, Monty was uh, a good friend and lived with me for a while, and so we were fairly abusive to one another. <laughs> and our line was like Dicky Spiegel at 6'9", and, and, and the next guy to me was, was Pearson at about 6'10", and then there was me. <laughs> and then there was Jim Kemp at about 6'11", and then there was Irwin, and then there was Eugene Stewart, and there was Monty at 6'4". They were huge across the front. They were really big people. So, I'd give Monty a hard time and I'd say, Monty, you couldn't catch the flu in a New York subway. You just can't catch the ball. And he said, I can't see you. <laughs> so we beat each other pretty good. Uh, the, last, the last thing I would say is I, I want to talk about a play for you, for you guys that, that haven't been around football, you wives, um, and people that have learned. We had, a, we had a play, it was called The Trap, which 332 was the play number. And in that play, each person had a responsibility. And now that I've looked back and analyzed some of those positions, Terry and Kenny, and some of you guys have played quarterback, um, you thought about how important you were in that play. And, and what I remember was, if, if you guys trained a lot, you turned your feet like this so that you would have them out of the way, to, to, to make the handoff. If you remember, Coach, you told us. I remember being with the op, Coach Ellis, an offensive lineman, and looking down there. Y'all remember the movie, uh, The Karate Kid, when they did Paint the Fence and Wax? That's what these guys were doing. You look at the quarterback. They're doing like that. They're doing weird stuff. 
down into the trenches where the big men lived, there would be grunts and groans and pain and pillage and, and murder and all kinds of craziness going on. But I'd, I'd listen out toward, toward the uh, wide receivers because they would be kind of split out out there. Sorry, man. I, 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 I'd hear those guys and the words that you'd hear out of those guys were, Stop it! No, you stop it! You stop it! And the defensive backs and the wide receivers would be really going out again. And the centers, they, you know, they just thought, snap the ball, I got my deal done. Irwin, when, when he was over there, would block down and the, tie, and the strong tackle would block down and Monty would just hope they were going to throw him a pass and and somebody would run through. But the important thing that you need to know is the guy making the trap was really the most important guy on the team. <laughs> it was the most important position. It was kind of like the sun is to the solar system. <laughs> is that Everything rotated around that particular position, which was the point guard. The point guard was kind of like the Genghis Khan of his time. <laughs> in fact, in the movie, in the movie The Godfather, they, they changed the verbiage because they didn't want to offend anybody, but originally the line was, send him a quick guard that he can't refuse. <laughs> it's, it's a legendary position. And so the quick guard came across when a defensive lineman would see those guys walk down, he would step across the line thinking, it's me. I'm going to make a play. And the quick guard, how many quick guards we got in here? One, two, look at them. Assassin. <laughs> Assassin. And the quick guard's job was to catch the guy who stepped across the line from the other team who says, I'm here to make the tackle. And your job was to come right through his ear. <laughs> And so even at my size, I was brutal. <laughs> they teed him up. And the one play I remember so well, Sam Henderson ran. If y'all remember, Sam used to carry the ball rather than his hand or tuck the ankle. He carried it like a watermelon under him. And we ran it against, I think, Roswell. And we ran the trap, and it was so well run that everybody was down, and they were... They were groveling and fighting in position, and they started looking for the ball, the referee and the players. And we looked up, and Sam was about 50 yards down the field by himself. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, the last thing that I'd like to say is that I met a man um, in those days, in, when I was a junior, that um, was one of the finest individuals that I've known in my life and certainly one of the best coaches and his, his name was Ellis. And, and the guy was an unbelievable teacher of young men. He did, it with, he did it with a heart and a passion. Most line coaches have a tendency to teach um, with a little bit of anger in your voice. They try to fire you up like that, but he was the kind of man that you just, you just wanted to work for. And he became my friend after I left high school. And um, uh, will always have a, a fond place in my heart. Finally, last thing. C.S. Lewis said, friendship is unnecessary, like philosophy and art. It has no survival value Rather, it is one of those things that give value to survival. If you survive, you need friendship. That's all this really means to me, is friendship. I, I don't run the trap anymore. Well, occasionally my grandkids will <laughs> step through the line in the wrong place, and I'll knock them down. <laughs> I love you, my friends. Thank you. That's going to be pretty hard to talk, okay? <laughs> Arnold, uh, Arnold, I'm going to ask Arnold Thomas to come and make The thing that I think about Arnold, I'm going to say something real quickly. Arnold was a, you know, when I was a sophomore, he was a senior. He's one of those guys that I just thought, 
That's Arnold Thomas, man. He was a kicker, you know, we thought about that. But I tell you what Arnold has done. He spent his whole life working with working with young people. And he, he's done an amazing job. He's been involved in kids in school for how long, Arnold? Over over thirty years. So uh, you've know, done an amazing job, I, and, and they did make a great point here. Uh, a lot of these guys I hadn't seen until uh, 2013, and, and believe it or not, there's I talk to Mike and, and Arlo quite a bit now, and uh, it means a great deal to me. Arlo, we'll let you have it still. Hard to follow there on that. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody that's here tonight, especially uh, Bobby and uh, Nikki for getting a lot of this going. But mainly thank you all for being here tonight to pay tribute to these men sitting over here. That, um, you know, to, to honor them, but, but more importantly than their coaching abilities, were their, their leadership, their guidance, uh, their life lessons they taught us, and uh, that's that's the main thing we're here for. And, it, and on top of that, all the time they're doing that, they're sacrificing being time with their families and their kids, except the majority of the kids grow up in the gyms or whatever around them, but it was certainly, uh, we certainly appreciate all that you've done for us. I'm going to try to be kind of brief and summarize this, touch on a few things. Mike, I'll touch on a few things that Mike also touched on. I'm going to go across a few things. But first of all, you know, how do we win a championship? Well, we, we, we dedicated ourselves. We wanted to work harder, set a goal to win it, do these kind of things that everybody does. And if you'll know what the last one we had in the newspaper text and stuff, it called it the perfect storm. That, that's what I turned up as the perfect storm when, we, when, when the state championship came in. And in order to have a perfect storm, I know you probably remember the movie with, with uh, George Clooney and Mark Wahlberg, you have to have warm air from a low pressure system coming from one direction and the flow of cool, dry, generated pressure coming from the other, and you have to have a hurricane moisture. Well, with that happening, the, the way I, that's the way I described the 1970 state championship team was a, the perfect storm. And that starts with Coach, Coach Etheridge, Coach Ellis, and Coach Tone. That's, that's three coming from Monahan's, getting Coach Graves, and getting this starting to go. And it, uh, you know, it kind of formed and kind of kept going and getting better and better, you know. And, and, and that perfect storm had to come because we had the athletes coming in from Houston, Iser, and Highland. Once again, there's three forces coming together, and the coaches molding us all together to to do things like that. Now, before I go into a little bit further on that, I'm going to touch a little bit, as Mike did, where some of us started back in 1964, boys club started the boys club football teams, and there were four teams. And I'm just going to throw out a few names here that, uh, that played with the varsity. Um, first of all, the boys club Steers they had uh, Don Gerth and Danny Burleson. The ABC Blue Devils had Lynn Weber, George Bingham, Bobby Attaway. <coughs> the boys Golden Eagles, Eagles had uh, Jim Jeffers and the... the, the uh, J.C. Roughnecks, uh, and we went 0-6. <laughs> but, and, and I was a quarterback and a defensive tackle. <laughs> but, 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 but the Roughnecks, and I, we had more people play for the varsity, and that was the ones he said was Mike Cooper, Dan Foster, Jerry White, Erwin Johnson, myself, and there could be a few more, because when I pulled out those pictures, the other three teams had 18 players, we only had 12, so that must have been a photo day that we didn't have everybody there. Anyway, that's where it started back. And what, what I'm talking, getting at there is it started back, that was, that was a dream back in the, that time, 10, 11 years, just to play for the Hobbs Eagles. We, we watched that dream come true, and then we also carried another step by winning the state championship. But that's what that was made of, was dreams to just be a Hobbs Eagle and wear that uniform. Now I'm going to quickly recap our season, and some games are going to take you 10 seconds and some may take a minute or two, but I'll start with the Archbishop Bulldogs. You know, what can I say? They always had good teams. They were good. Uh, they won the state championship the year before, and, uh, you know, we opened, we lost 13 to 7, and this is a game that you also got to remember that Dickey had a 77-yard touchdown call back, and he'll tell you to this day, he never pushed off even in practice, okay? <laughs> we never saw that call. <laughs> It was one pass. On he got it on the tape. It was one pass in the tape. Dr. Artesia sent it to me. Oh, yeah. There you go. And the way we like to turn that out is, too, is we really didn't lose. We just ran out of time because we had the ball driving when the clock stopped. Okay, it was over. So, anyway, we're, we're going to give that to him. Game two, we opened up against the, we were against the Kermit Yellow Jackets. And the five, five previous years were really close games. 
and uh, this was supposed to be close, and they were running the Texas uh, triple option, and that was at that time something that was really feared. The coaches, coaches on what to do and everything, and uh, they prepared us well, yeah, very well. And, and really, all I can say about that is uh, it was a trip, to the, uh, uh, trip to the woodshed for the Kermit Yellow Jackets. It was 55 to six, and they scored in the last minute. So we were one and one. We started to get our uh, our uh, confidence build. Mojo. Okay. <laughs> then we went. We had Love Coronado coming in. They were they were rated number ten in Texas. And if you're rated in the top ten in the state of Texas in 4A, you're, it's pretty pretty impressive. Uh, you know, and it was our homecoming and a big thing for us. They had a guy named Gary Oliva that was our quarterback. Was Mister Everything did it all for them. Before we knew it, the coaches looked on the side of it. It's 14 to nothing then, and we finally scored right before half, like 14 seven. And then we just fast forward to the last two minutes of the game. You know, they they had scored and uh, and it was they were up 20, uh, 20 to seven. Then because they missed an extra point, and then we scored, made it twenty to fourteen. And uh, what's so impressive about that is that it's it's fourth and nine on our own twenty one, and uh, Terry hits Charlie Hutchins out of the back for thirty seven yards. Hits their forty two. Next play, give it to Charlie around the end for thirty three. Next play, it's a pass from Terry to. To, uh, no, it's a run with Charles to score, and now it's 20 to 20. It's, we're going to win it all. Now, I'm going to stop right there for just a second because it's 20 to 20. You guys know me out here. How many of you ever know that the person that holds the extra points is a linebacker? No. It's a quarterback, it's a punter, it's a receiver. Danny, where are you? Come back to your boat. Danny Sugar Bear Burroughs. Tell me. One of the reasons he was a holder is he has the best pair of hands. I mean, he could. Take anything. So anyway, yeah, I want you all. The snap comes back from camp. There's the, the hole, the set, the kick. It's 21-20. Yes, we win our homecoming. Okay. But hold on a minute. Well, I kicked it. But what I'm trying to say is, you can remember that it was 21-20. But what you don't remember is that they we had to kick off. They drove down to our 11-yard line and Mr. Doing everything for them, missed a 21 yard field goal. No big deal. We still won, but yes, sir. I want to say uh, just a point of correction here with actually Johnny that threw those passes. That's it, Terry? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry, Ronnie. I apologize. I'm glad you caught that. I'm glad you caught that. Well, Ronnie's there. And actually, and actually, I do have Ronnie's name written there. I said Terry. Terry, thank you. Anyway, I don't know how that goes. Anyway, that was a storybook in the entire trial. I apologize, Ronnie. I got some comments about you later. Anyway. <laughs> then we got Amarillo and Paladura coming in, and, and they're rated number uh, six in the state of Texas. And uh, that was one of those games that come back and forth. And they were real good, and they, they were ahead of us 21-20 um, because I had missed an extra point. And, God bless Manny Martins, and, and you know he did a great job about this. In the paper clipping, and he, the wind blew that kid. I loved it when he tried to take care of me. I did some it, okay? It was nice. He even said it was a, it was, it was, you know, great. But that just missed. So anyway, we come back and score in the last few seconds to win that game. And we, what we've proven there is we we can come back and we can play with these people. So so we go up, you know, two to one, you know, I mean uh, three and one on them. And the other big thing about that is that nobody knew what was going on because after after they scored, no, after we that they scored to go up 21-20, they had to kick off to us. Ball goes out of bounds on the team. None of us, nobody in the stands, knew what the heck was going on except Coach Etheridge and maybe the coaches because he used a little known rule that if you kick the ball out of bounds, you can penalize them five yards and kick again, or you can take the ball on the 40-yard line. So he takes on the 40, the whole stands, like, I don't know if what's going on. We're like, okay, we've got 60 yards to go. We go down, and we score, and we win. But that was that was because the coach knew all the rules, and that was a big game for us. The next one, we got Monahans. Well, you know what happened? These guys came from Monahans, okay? So a uh, little quick known thing there. Some of you might not know this, but do you know that, that, that Coach Tone, was on the 1948 Monahan State Championship team. Also, he is on the Monahan's all-time football team as a quick guard. Coach Ellis played at McCain. <laughs> yeah, quick guard. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and Coach uh, Coach Ellis grew up right down the 
roadways in McCain, small school. Coach Etheridge, I never, I don't, I guess I never been asked him today. He grew up in Sundown, another little small town school. These guys come together and and and, and bring us to that. So the, the main thing I mean, remember about the Monahans game is it's nothing, nothing at half because they're running the same place we're running. So when they line up, we know what they're doing. They know what we're doing. Okay? And I found out today from from um, uh, Coach Williams what happened was the second half and that. Ronnie, this is where Ronnie gets injured, right before half. Terry comes in and takes over, but they put in the week before 722, which was the fate to Charlie, the quarterback, whether it be Ronnie or Terry, bootleg around, and that's how we got our first scores. They did that. Terry runs 60-something yards down about the one or two. We score it anyway. We end up winning. And the, the thing there is, and, and is, as we've told people, is when we were seniors in that team, you didn't want to miss a practice. And you didn't want to get injured, miss a game or anything, because you may not get your job back. And that's right. Unfortunately, that's what happened. With Terry came in, and Ronnie, I might have started another game. I'm not sure. I don't think so. But anyway, we knew that if Terry got injured, he was coming back in. We knew that there was people to back people up. And it, was, it was really uh, something. That game ended up 14 to nothing, and it was their homecoming. We kind of beat them. We go to Isla the Bel Air the next game, and uh, it's, un, it's, it's not district. They run an unbalanced. They kind of run on us and score early, but it's called back. We finally, coaches get us in at halftime and explain to us how we are making our adjustments, and it's good. So anyway, we're 5-1. and one. We beat them 35-14. Now I'm going to jump into district real quick, and this is kind of quick, because we opened with the Carlsbad Cavemen. That's our district opener. Talk was this was going to be a heck of a game. It's going to decide who wins the district, and guess what it did? Final score was 28 to nothing to us. We're six and one. I don't need to say anything else about Cavemen. Then we go to Roswell Goddard. I call this a numbers game. The score was 56 to nothing. District record is now 2 and 0. Points scored by Hobbs in their first two district games is 84. How many do we give up defensively? Zero. Okay, we're seven and one. Then we take on Clovis. Had a heck of a running back named Ronnie Hubble. Hubby, that's it. And he was a stud. Okay, and uh, defense stepped up, and they had seven yards of rushing and about uh, 92 yards passing. We held them under, under 100 yards, and uh, the big thing there, the final score was 31 to nothing, and now we've scored, um, in district, we've scored 112, and how many they scored now still on the stand? Zero. Zero. Defense is still running up, and at this point, I'll tell you that Paul Hewlett couldn't be here, but he sent me a text and said, just remind them. And remind all the people there and the coaches that defense wins championships. You can let y'all know that. And then, we, then we had Lovington, which was a non district game, and they were number one, three A in the state of New Mexico. We were ranked number one, four A, and it was 49 to nothing. We're 9 and 1. We don't need to talk about what happened in that massacre. Then we go to Roswell, the, the Coyotes, quarterback named Damon Richards, and running back named uh, Larry Honeycutt. Um, we were number one in the state, they were number two, and this was going to be the game that decided the state championship, I mean, excuse me, the district championship. Final score was 28 to 6, and I can tell you to this day, and all of us can tell you, Larry Honeycutt didn't catch that six points, it bounced. Larry <laughs> Yeah, and Larry, Larry told him that, it, didn't, it bounced. So, at the end of our district, we scored 161 points, and we gave up six, and that six came in the last 10 or 15 seconds of the, of the game. So, uh, we were pretty well on our way. Now we're going to play Santa Fe, and we're thinking got we got, huh? Do what? So you got to finish. Oh, you gave up six points. Yeah, right? they only gave up six points. Okay, for the defense. The point about that Monahan's game is when the defenses knew each other too, and it was seven twenty-two key. Oh, the play that we ran, we pulled the guard the wrong way. The wrong way. <laughs> the quarterback went the other the way. The slow guard. The linebacker went with the guard. <laughs> Wow. That's got stuff. Hey, was with you when you left there, wasn't he? No. Okay, but the head, the guy to go was hit. Okay. Anyway, we go in to play the semifinals, and we're thinking, well, we got first of all, we got to get by. Santa Fe, but we're thinking we're going to play Artis again. Well, that didn't happen because Highlands upset them. But anyway, we play Santa Fe, and it's a close game, 21 to 16 the last couple of minutes, and then we, we score a couple of late ones to make it 35 16. But the most important thing I'll remember about this and touch on a quick story is right before halftime, we're getting ready to kick the field goal if we need to. We don't have to. I throw the shoe off. We come out in the second half. We scored. 
Can you find the shoe? We don't find the shoe the rest of the night. We have our square toe kicking shoe. We, we, we don't find it. Well, we don't have it the next game. And, you know, and the, the story goes, is finally, Chief told me years later, he had ran into somebody, and a cheerleader had stolen that. They got it bronze, and it's in their trophy case as a semifinal trophy. So, so one of these days, I'm going to go to Santa Fe and see if I can't get that shoe back. I meant something. So that's the story on that. The, the championship game, what can I say, 1970, that, that game on Thanksgiving Day, and every Thanksgiving, I, I just think, okay, they, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, we played on Thanksgiving Day and won the state championship. This was a great day for the players, the coaches, the fans, the cheerleaders, the band, the city of Hobbs, because we brought a state championship. Final score was 20 to nothing. You know, some, some accomplishments there. Individual was Coach Etheridge was our, um, was named the coach of the year for, for um, uh, New Mexico. Uh, we had some people make some, and, and another quick thing, and I know most of you know this, but in case you don't, and it, this is hard to do, this man has won a state championship in New Mexico and in Texas in 19, with us in 1970 and in Port Nature's Grove in 1975. So that's hard to do to win it in two states. And, and that, was, that was really a remarkable speaks of him and his, his ability. And Coach Clearman was with him to do that too. You know, we had a few, we had a few uh, other accolades. Charles Hutchins was the Offensive Player of the Year. Uh, offensively, Dickie, Monty, Eugene Stewart, Irwin made All-State defensively. Uh, Paul Coy, Jim Jeffers, Tim Baird, Henderson, Frank Kemp, and myself made it on the defense side. But in my mind, the All-State team should have been the Hobbs Eagles. Because we, we were uh, yeah, very... Well, that was close to them. Well, it was. It was. <laughs> you know, and, and in closing, I, I'm kind of like, kind of like Mike. I, I just want to mention that you know, winning the state championship was great. It was a great feeling. You know, talking to Vernon today, he said, yeah, he wanted that feeling again because he wanted it in track. But, but what's more important than that is the, the friendships, the, 40, the 45, 40 years, 50 years we've been together. And we show up and we go back and we reminisce. And we'll probably have another one of these and we get together and there'll be more people we know. But you know, the, the thing there is we all came together. These guys brought us together. Um, the fans, some of you people are here that, that didn't play, but you were in the stands rooting for us. Uh, just things like that. It, it's, it's that type of thing that brings us together. And believe me, in closing, all I can just say to you is once an eagle, always an eagle. That's pretty amazing. You know, I think back to that 1970 team, I was a sophomore, and uh, you, you guys were cool we all wanted to be. You know, and he really says the standard for Hobbs High School football for a long, long time. I'm going to bring up the next guy. And no, I don't even have to introduce him. This is Dr. Dan Foster. He's a good friend of mine. Uh, you know, he's done a lot of great things in my life. And uh, he's going to tell you a little bit about 1972. One, 71. Thank you, guys. I'm slipping here. Thank you. Sure, it's great to see everybody. A lot of people I haven't seen in 40 years. and. Uh, it's really fun. It's been fun, especially seeing some of the girls like Miss Miss Becky there that I used to chase around. It's just awesome. And, uh, I just feel like uh, it's, it was a blessing coming from Hobbs. All of us were raised with middle class values, and our parents and our friends and our coaches taught us to work hard and be the best that we could and take care of our families and. And I think that's the greatest thing that we all got from growing up there in Hobbs at that time period. And uh, some things I remember from early on, I remember back in uh, at Highland Junior High, about half of us were chewing back at the time, and we had this coach named Coach Bear. Well, he caught us chewing back in the locker room, and he made us all lie down flat on our backs before practice with chew in our mouth. And he would not let us spit until we all got sick. So he, he cured most of us from it. And uh, I'll never, uh, with, it's great to see David Sage, my old buddy. I hadn't seen him forever. Uh, David and I used to ride to school together every day in high school, and he paid me $2 a week to pay for this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that bad, and it covered it. <laughs> yeah, it was. It covered it good. 
And uh, the other thing I was thinking about was uh, just like some of the people that we grew up with there in Hobbs, that, that skinny, uh, red-headed, freckled-faced FFA boy that was here last night that won all those world championships and then his kids are doing the same thing. And then just think that head of NASA came from Hobbs, Wayne Hale, who was in our class there. And that was when they were sending people to the moon and everything, and, and a boy from Hobbs was running the show back then. That was pretty amazing. Well, uh, getting football, uh, we uh, I think that most of us would feel like, in a way, it was a disappointing season. We didn't win state because we had pretty much the whole team back from the previous year, a lot of the key players. But, uh, I mean, it was still a very good year. We had a lot of talented players. We had a huge offensive line. We had an excellent quarterback, Ronnie, and an uh, unbelievable running back, uh, John Black. And we had uh, guys like Vernon Patterson with elite speed. I mean, it was, it was a very talented team. Some of the games that I remember, uh, Monahan's again, that was a, a big, tough game. They were a well-ranked team, and then, of course, uh, Remember the Clovis game playing against uh, Ron Hubby again, everybody on defense, he, that dude was hard to tackle. He was built like a refrigerator. <laughs> he, he went on to play at a and and had a good career, played with Paul Hewlett there uh, for a few years. And uh, of course, uh, going off and uh, losing the game at State, I think broke all of our hearts. We had some uh, pretty untimely turnovers, and when you have turnovers in a tight game like that, it's going to end up costing you. But overall, I mean, all of us feel so blessed to have come from Hobbs and played together, and I'm just so thrilled to see everybody. It's just awesome. Thank you. guys from 1971, I was a junior, I ran around with most of these guys. And the boy, when, uh, when they all took off, I looked around my senior year and everybody was gone. And you know, I, I, I was lost. And I actually, Dennis Timms, my dear, dear friend, he kind of pulled me out of the gutter and, and did a great job. The next guy I'm really going to introduce, I, I just think the world of, uh, we talked about him a little bit as an elite athlete. Uh, I asked him one time, I said, I thought he was on every track. <coughs> Brett Relay, anything that went on, he was the guy that won. And he said, Bobby, I didn't even run track until I was a sophomore. <laughs> so, so you know, it, it's amazing. I, I was telling him, sitting over here, Kevin and I talking a few minutes ago, and said, man, you should have came higher. We'd have been amazing. <laughs> but, <laughs> and, and he said he lived right on the border. And, you know, he said, the reason I didn't go to Heiser, he said, y'all didn't have a Dairy Queen. <laughs> so, so, anyway, I want to introduce uh, Mr. Vernon Patterson, uh, probably the fastest man in New Mexico at that time, and probably still holds records today, but uh, come on up, Vernon. Good evening, everybody. First of all, I'd like to thank the committee, Bobby, Nikki, Kevin. Man, you guys have done an awful, an awesome job. Really I'd also like to challenge everybody. There's going to be another one. Okay, Nick, Bobby, Kevin. <laughs> okay, we're going to try to do this again. And I, I challenge everybody to try to bring someone new, someone who didn't make the last one, or the one before, you know. We all know where our former players are and our, our uh, students and all. And it would be good if you just really reached out and grabbed somebody that didn't make it to give them a chance to be here. Okay, now the 1972 team. Uh, can I get those guys to stand up? How many guys we got here? Wave your hand, stand up. If you can't stand, wave your hand. All right. All right. That is the last team to win the state championship in football. My guys. Okay. Now, when season started out, they had uh, Albuquerque West Mesa, Las Cruces Mayfield, Carlsbad, and then they listed Hobbs. They say you can throw them all in a hat and shake it if you're going to figure out who the champion was. In the end, it was us. All right. Uh, Ray Bars played for West Mesa. He had rushed for 2,000 yards in previous seasons. They say, could he get 3,000? We shut them out, 28 zero. Yeah. Our defense came on the beginning of the season. We played Lovington first, 37 nothing. So we began with two shutouts. Had to beat the 70 team, I think. That's about the only thing we could beat them in. I tried, man. I looked at all the stats. I said, God. 
man, that's 17. That got us here. Got us there. Got us here. Got us here. Got us here. Every category, man. That 17 was awesome. And uh, we began with a new head coach. You left it in good hands. Your system worked. As Tommy Garrett said, same place, same offense, same defense. Yeah, we put it together. We had to change the backfield. We lost everybody. We lost guys like the All-States, Tim Bear, Aguilar, Person, Seagull, Jim Bob Ferguson, Jim Kim. We also lost Pryor, Foster, Whitley, Black, Sage, Gray, Barker, McMurray, Fred. These were all guys that started on the previous team. So they had a lot of holes to fill. That's a big job for Coach. But he began first by putting his staff together. He added Coach Williams, Coach James, Coach Ellis Remain. That was big. His next challenge was to replace the, uh, well, he replaced all the All-Staters. Our rock hard defense shut out the first two opponents, as I said, Lovington and West Mesa. And then we split the next four games with the Texas teams. We beat Monahans too. That's real. <laughs> all right. Uh, my most impressive game was the uh, Odessa High game. It was losses. Losses meant more to me. Those were the ones I remember. The wins came, so we won all the time, it seemed like. But the losses. We lost to Odessa High. And we also lost to uh, Love of Monterey. Close games, but we lost. After that, we went into district play. We took it all away. And then we got to uh, play Albuquerque Highland for the semifinal game. The defense stepped up again. Defense does win championships. 28 to 0. 21 0. Let's give them that. Okay. Now, I look at our team and I realize we were a team of capable of capable of striking from anywhere. We were a big play team. We had uh Greg Hutchins. He returned to kick off 100 yards. Unbeaten, untied. You can't do nothing with it, yeah. Okay. George Bean passed to Dwayne Cunningham, 85 yard touchdown. Oh, I returned the kickoff <laughs> by 83 yards. That's another one. Okay. George B passes Greg Hutchins 80 yards. Uh, Greg Hutchins returns a punt for 80 yards. I got a 71 yard. George B passes to, uh, uh, let's see who we got here. He had a 66 yard TD. Oh, that was to me too. <laughs> Ken, Kenny Walker passes to uh, Kevin. 55 yards. These are all touchdowns, man. So we could score at any time in any place. And then uh, in the one end. Game? No, no, no. no. <laughs> but look at this, man. Over one season. One season. One season. One season. All of these big plays. I got nine big plays right now, right? And I'm going to tell you about each one. No, wait, no. We're going to make Okay. But, anyways, uh, the guys the guys were fantastic, man. We, we had to fill in a lot of holes. I think we had 14 returning lettermen and 28 first-year guys. And uh, I don't know how they picked it because nobody played both ways. So that meant you got a position, you stuck there. You know, they rebuilt the backfield, they rebuilt the uh, defensive secondary. We had uh, John Stanfield and Dyer and Big John Rodriguez return on defense, Alex Carrillo on offense. And uh, they shifted Kenny and I over to the offensive side. I asked Coach Williams today, Man, why'd you move us to the offensive side? Kenny wanted to go. I didn't. Okay. But he said, Coach Ellis had something to do with that. And he asked, he told him, he said, because they can run. <laughs> so that's how we got all moved over to the offense. But uh, the 72 team, like I say, we're the last ones to win state. We had a good season. And that's all I got for you. Okay. <laughs> That's pretty good to get budget. You know, you, we kind of go down these, this list of years. It's amazing the teams that you guys put together and, you know, were a part of. Uh, I, and I, I think I go back to one thing that you hear time and time again, just work at it, work at it, work at it. And we continue to do that in our lives, and I think that started with these gentlemen over here. Okay, next guy's going to be Mr. Johnny Johnson. That top line I've talked a little bit. Johnny's got a similar affliction to Arnold and I, if you guys notice, okay? You know, it, <laughs> but uh, he's going to talk about 1973. That was a team that actually went to the state finals, and I'll let him go from there. Thank you, Bobby. Also, want to say thank you for putting this night together. And Nikki, good job. 
and I know it takes a lot of work to make it seem like it's effortlessly. So just a testimony to their, their efforts. Thank you for the coaches for, for setting the, the standard. Uh, I grew up, when you came, I was the eighth grade. So I was weaned on your system. I had the good fortune from going back into the uh, boys club days. I think I've played every position in, on the team except for center. Jim Browning, you were the best center ever. <laughs> but uh, Coach Williams explained something to me many years after, after I always wondered about this. And, and I've got a 21 on, on my jersey. <coughs> When I was a junior, I, I played on the team behind Vernon Patterson. I knew I wasn't going to be playing a whole lot. <laughs> I, I got to play a lot of special teams, and it was a fun time, and, and we won the state championship. And then, um, as the story unfolds, I found out 30 years later that after that game, the coaches met at Lester's restaurant. Uh, and we're talking about next year. What are we going to do next year? And apparently they had a, a position to fill. And Coach Williams said, Johnny Johnson will do that. And, and so they made me from a halfback to a strong guard. In our in our offense, very similar because they're both pulling and blocking in the, in the flats. So it was good. We went to state. We, we did not win that game. Um, Chuck Ellison. I, I, I'm here to say that if, if you were the quarterback that game, I think we might have uh, had a different story, but that's just my own view. Um, I'd like to uh, recognize the, the, our older statesmen, if you guys will, the, 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 the guys that we used to look up to, Dan Foster. I remember sitting in the, the backs group as we were getting ready for two a days, and you had some hammers for arms, and I'm looking at you, man, I'm gonna be like that guy someday, you know. So, yeah, and uh, just just looking up to, to wanting to be a Hobbs Eagle is a big deal, and so uh, getting together for for these events to me, it's it's about looking back and sharing those football memories, but it's also memories childhood memories. Ops was a great place to grow up. Um, I, I, I had a wonderful visit with Bobby Eads last night. We talked about, you know, when I first moved to Hobbs, we were next door neighbors when I was four years old, and we talked about some of the silly things that we did as children there, and I got to speak with Greg Mullinghouse, which he moved out of high school, or out of Hobbs during the high school years. A couple of things that to me are, I call them flashpoint memories. That's, there are things in life that, that yeah, I think each of us can look back on and, and, and you remember it like it was yesterday. You remember every, what the smell like, who was there. It was just that way. And my football days were full of those flashpoint memories. Um, I won't go through each and every one of them. I just the, 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 the big hits that you might have had. Um, the street fire I told you last night about the goal line stand against uh, Clovis. And this is when I was a junior. But uh, my, one of my special teams, I got to be on the, the goal line defense. And we were up 6-0. to zero, And the game was last couple of minutes of the game. And Clovis had the ball first and goal on the one yard line. We stuffed it. Steve Dyer stuffed it. <laughs> on the third play, uh, it was third and one, and, and they sent the fullback in, and Steve met this guy right at the line of scrimmage, and it was like he ran into a tree, and, and he bent over backwards. That made the difference. That, that was the difference. So, and I've always been impressed with that. You got you know, in the, in the Monday games when they play the, 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 the video, is film, and they go back and forth, back and forth. 
they must have gone back and forth over that play about 10 <laughs> times talking about it. what an impressive hit that was. So that was good. Um, flashpoints to me also to the universal weight machine. <laughs> now I see all these, a room full of exercise equipment and we had a universal weight machine. We also had stick wrestling. <laughs> Foster wrestling. Yeah, those things. Well, my, I, I, a quick story for me is personal on, on uh, universal weight machine. So as a sophomore coming into the, just graduated from junior high and I'm, my goal was to be in football shape at the first day of two days. And so I ran sprints, I'd run a house length and walk a house length and all the way to high school and then lift weights and then jog home. And uh, so the first day I'm up there and I, I knew all these coaches that were the, the, I didn't know which ones they were, but I knew that they were varsity football coaches. So I'm well, I'm going to lift weights, and they're watching me from across the way, and I get on the bench press, and I put it, I don't know, 140, 150 pounds, and, oh, I could not budge this thing, you know, and I wondered about it, and, and well, I put it to 120, and same thing, and I dropped it to 100 pounds, and the same thing, and they're kind of snickering at me, and I'm feeling like, oh, man, I might as well, you know, go try out for the band or something, and, <laughs> And then they came over and said, well, son, are you having some problems? And I said, well, I, I thought I could at least do this. And then they pulled a nail out of the bottom of the whole sky. <laughs> <laughs> they had me. I was, I was the first chump. <laughs> I remember Eagle Blazers on game day. That was, that was something special to, to wear that golden jacket. You know, it, was, it was something special. Riding the Eagle bus, that was cool. It was a boy, let's get to do that. Getting a hug from the cheerleaders after the game. <laughs> How many guys remember the mud bowl in Roswell? Spell. <laughs> that was that was a game you couldn't even see your number at the end of the game, and we were winning, so they were substituting, go in and play tight end, you know. What they do, what play, just go play. <laughs> it was a fun day. I remember practicing, and the, 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 the saying that Coach Tom had, perfect practice makes perfect. And he was, he was a believer in that, and, and we had perfect practices. And then getting ready for our state championship, I mean our, our district championship game against Clovis, and the state was said it would, we would win a game by one or two touchdowns, three touchdowns, and then Clovis would play the same team the next week and blow them out 40 to 10, you know, they're just wearing them out. And so poor Hobbs is up for a, a shellacking coming up. We didn't think that in the, in the practice. We had the best week of practice ever. We went into that game, we had 450 yards of offense, and they had under 100. But it was 0-0 zero to zero with four minutes left in the game. And our defense over-pursued on, on one, and it went to the left, and he went all the way around to the right, and we lost that game. To me, that was one of those memories that Maybe I don't ever want to forget because to remember how hard you work for something and then it just didn't turn our way. And, and, and that brings us into some of the things that, that as coaches you taught us. You taught us how to win. What does it take to win? The sacrifice, the extra effort, the don't give up. You win in the fourth quarter. Always. I, I'm firm believer in that. Kelly affirmed that. But you also taught us how to lose with grace and with dignity, and sometimes it just doesn't go your way. So, those are things. Finally, I, I was just listening to a couple of good things about football discipline. You know, you had to sacrifice, and, and that each each one of you have carried that forward in your your days today and your lives. And, and uh, 
that's that's where you got it. I mentioned perfect practice, make perfect teamwork. We relied on each other. The special bonds that that made that that, uh, that you just had. I mentioned fourth quarter, never quitting. That same that I was telling you about the the backs meeting. Coach Ellis was in there and he's talking to us and he said. Okay, we're going to be good sports, and we're going to—we're here to have fun. That's the most important thing. <coughs> and it's a lot more fun to win than it is to lose. So we're going to figure out how to win. He—he <laughs> he did that, and the camaraderie that, that we've all had is, is just something that's really special to me. And, and I look forward to these events. Uh, it's just everybody comes from halfway across the country. Uh, to gather and, and talk about special times and these were special times. Um, we have that shared memories and, and you know, I'm sure our wives have heard all the stories. I know mine has. She, uh, do you remember when the, when, the, when the Brewster Club used to sell your picture and put it in a store and so you had it and then they'd give it back to you at the end of the year? My wife dug that out of a cedar chest and, and framed it and put it in the study room. So it's a, a reminder of my glory days. I guess. <laughs> so just in, in wrapping up, I just wanted to say thank you for everybody that, that came here. Bobby, thank you. Nikki, thank you. Coaches, um, you've you've made a difference in a lot of people's lives. And. Uh, we would do you proud to pass that on. So that's what we're trying to do. You know, the thing that resonates can, through this evening is winning. Okay? You hear winners. And I think as I look around this room, I think that's translated into lifetimes of winning. You know, we have a federal judge sitting over there. You know, I have a physician sitting here on the, uh, you know, an amazing group of guys. I know most of you, I see you're in your professions, and you know, y'all done an outstanding job. But you know, this next person that I'm gonna ask to come up, I think she's a winner too. Uh, Nikki, I had the opportunity. Nikki was one of those ladies that we always wanted to, to, to be with. I wish Roy Cooper was here now, because I can tell you, I'm glad he's not, I'm gonna tell you a story. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so Nikki's gonna go under the table right now. But I was out of Roy's house one day, and he said, "You know, I'd like to date an older woman." And he said, "You know any Bob?" I, well, certainly I know a few. He said, uh, "Tell me about him." I said, "Well, you remember Nikki?" And he said, "Oh yeah, I remember Nikki." He said, uh, "Have her call me." I said, <laughs> <laughs> this is not like Roy, doesn't it? Okay. And so I said, I looked at him. I said, "Roy, Roy." Don't you remember when we were sophomores and we'd see her walk across the, the cafeteria and we said, oh, wow, you think she's going to call you, man? <laughs> so, so he ended up with her number, and I think he drove her nuts, okay? And uh, it was a short-lived situation. But, uh, but anyway, you know, it was really neat. But i tell you what, 10 years ago, I had the opportunity to meet Nikki. We figured out we, lived, we were working about half a mile from each other and enjoyed lunch. And... Uh, my wife got to know her a little bit also, but she's been an amazing uh, friend. Uh, she's been to all of us, not just me. But I'd like her to come up and talk a little bit also. Thank you. You can probably hear me anyway, because I have that loud McFarland voice. But, um, you know, I'm thinking E-A-G-L-E-S. I get six minutes for each cheerleader that's not here. So, <laughs> um, I do want to be grateful and thankful for each one of you that are here. Um, you know, we're so blessed to have been a part of the community in Hobbs to, for me to share in these precious memories that the guys were talking about, to witness that loyalty, that teamwork, that passion, that drive, that, it, you know, it was, it was contagious uh, for all of us. So I'm grateful, I'm blessed to have those in my memory bank. And I hope you are blessed tonight for what we've shared this evening. I do have a few thank yous. 
Um, today we had a wonderful day with the ladies. I want to thank Debbie Kellum. She opened up her store. We had a fashion show. We went next door and had a glass of wine and just totally enjoyed being girls and had lunch together. Uh, Ray put together a huge song list for us uh, that we've been playing on and off during the reunion. Um, thank you to Ralph, who is a friend of mine, and we work together with many um, volunteer organizations, and, and he's come and helped us with uh, capture this memory. Um, but of course, our big thank you of uh, somebody that had the passion and the heart and everything to do this was Bobby. And uh, he always brings along his amazing team of Kay Ellen and Sister Marcy and friends that they'll do the grunt work so we can all jaw jack all night and just share memories and tell them over and over and over. So thank you ladies for helping us out. Uh, and Mr. Cooper is going to help me just a little bit. Um, if you see these, there's, these are, this is your party favor. And if you'll unroll them, or, or look at what Mike's got, and some of you are aware that um, you signed some things for us on here. And uh, so anyway, we had one framed for Mr. Kelly. As you notice, all this memorabilia and the, everything, I think came out of Bobby's study. Is that right, Mel? <laughs> I, I mean, I really think. You know, he likes to keep it close. So, um, anyway, thank you, Bobby. If you didn't get the opportunity to see Mike, we want to make sure that you have signed it. You want to pull it out. And this is what, that's what the little uh, collages look like. I think you'll recognize things on there like the Golden Gorillas, uh, some plays on there, uh, all the coaches' names are on there. Uh, every team member's number is on there probably multiple times. Uh, those uh, state playoff games are there and the scores. So it's just a little something for you to remember tonight and remember where you came from. I'll come see you guys. Anybody that hasn't signed it, Nikki, by the way, thanks for not going before. Because I want to tell you, <laughs> he and I are together now. <laughs> Who has to sign this? Okay, we're going to move on to kind of the end of the program. This was a kind of a hard part of the program for me. And I talked with the team about this part of the program because there's people that we wish were here and they can't be. Not because they didn't want to, but because they're gone. If you look around this room, we're not getting any younger guys, okay? So I think what's really amazing, we do get to share this. I'm really in a unique position because I have the opportunity to travel and see a lot of these guys, and it's really amazing. And as I've thought about presenting this little piece of the program, and I had some direction and some help, I thought about mentioning everyone, whether it's a player, a coach, a cheerleader, and someone special on our team, a manager. There's, there's more than you would imagine. But you know, uh, so I want, I'm going to do it a little bit different. There's a small video, and it's a guy that you're either going to love and you're going to hate, or you're going to love and you're going to hate. But he was a very, very special part of my life. Dummy, I may have a hard time with this one too. Okay? I, I met him in seventh grade. His uh, daughter called me a few months ago, Mary Bingham. Mary, Mary said, let's go to this right quick. Okay, one thing, you go out tonight, you fight, you skip. I've never played much defense. <laughs> <laughs> I had good guys that didn't play some. But when I got a chance to come in on offense, every play was designed for a touchdown. On a first down. It went from the guard to the center, the tackles, the ends, every single play is designed for a touchdown. It don't matter if it's third and 25. It 
Amazing group of people that have left us. Let's keep them in our memories. Okay, let's all stand up and get my hand, okay? We have compiled a list of every email address and every phone number of every player and friend of the teams. Uh, I, I would like to ask you, is that something that we can publish? Or is, if someone has a problem with that, just get in contact with Vicki or myself. And we'll make sure that it's not, but we do definitely want to publish that. And that way it's, we can stay in front of each other uh, and talk to each other and continue the friendships that we continue to build. Okay? It's an important part of what we're doing today and tomorrow. And I'd like to ask Steve Whitaker to come up close in prayer. You know, I'm so thankful all of us had an opportunity to live part of our lives outside of the United States and of New Mexico. <laughs> With that, I offer this prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you blessed every one of us with the opportunity to make wonderful friends and have wonderful memories. And that although all of us have taken different journeys and different paths, gone to different places in life, no matter where we go, we'll always have the common bond of being Hobbs Eagles. We thank you so much that you have allowed people, the coaches and teachers, and people in our life that have mentored us, encouraged us to be good citizens and good people, to touch the world around us with goodness. We're so thankful today for the people that have worked so hard, diligently to put this together for us. We ask that you just bless all of these people for the many good things that they have done. Bless the coaches, our friends, the people that have touched our lives and poured into us. We pray that you'll continue to bless us and that these friendships that we have made and our memories will last till our dying breath. We're thankful, so thankful today for the opportunity to be here and to laugh together again, to share stories and maybe even lie a little bit. We're thankful today 
that you have been good to us. And we just ask for your blessings on everyone in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.